All right. It looks like we are now live for another one of these fairly new uh, discussions in a series of uh, talks and, and discussions about important things in political theory and application. So a little bit of backstory. I started doing this about, uh, well, officially a month ago, but two months ago, I did a, a rather impromptu chat about um, po protests and policing. And then last month I did something about uh, the social contract. This month we're talking about free speech and cancel culture, if there is such a thing, um, and the Harper's letter. Next, next month I think we're probably going to talk about the mechanics of shuffling all these kids off uh, to school since that's going to be approaching and the political things surrounding that. So I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to also uh, ask everybody to make sure that their comments are relative, uh, you know, <laughs> their comments are relevant, not relative, relevant to the topic. So this is not an AMA. This is uh, a focused discussion on a particular set of, of topics. Um, Make sure that you're being civil with everybody. As you're going to find out, I am not a free speech absolutist, and I view things like this as sort of like being on my front porch and having a discussion rather than as the ideological construct of the marketplace of ideas where anything goes. But I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. So the, the thing that we're going to focus on to begin with is this Harper's letter. And I see from some of the comments that some people haven't read the Harper's letter. You probably do want to take a look at that because that's part of the context of the discussion. So what was the Harper's letter? It's a fairly short piece in Harper's Weekly, which is kind of a you know top tier opinion magazine that's been around for quite a while. And it was signed on by a lot of people who have quite a bit of, you could say, social capital or clout or whatever you want to call it, um, ranging from, you know, Noam Chomsky uh, to uh, people in the IDW like Barry Weiss to, um, you know, all sorts of people in between. I'm not going to rehearse and <laughs> try to pick out who is more important. And they're really worried about a big problem that's, that's uh, looming in front of us right now. So I'm going to read you some excerpts from it. And I'm going to say that there's, there's three main things for the excerpts that I'm reading. One is the big and present problem. They're calling out the left. Uh, the second, now that isn't a beer, that's a, uh, uh, um, what is that? Seltzer, Seltzer water. Um, got my mind on other things right now. So we're going to talk about the big and recent problem that they're talking about. Then they get down to specifics. And this is where things start to go off kilter for them, I would say, more than, than other places. And then they're speaking for all the rest of us. They're, they're doing something that's almost like a public service. So the big and recent problem. Here's, here's their, their stuff verbatim. This needed reckoning, reckoning about you know policing power, that sort of stuff. Racism has intensified a new set of moral attitudes and political commitments that tend to weaken our norms of open debate and tolerances of toleration of differences in favor of ideological conformity. As we applaud the first development, that is the needed reckoning, we also raise our voices against the second. And then they say, resistance must not be allowed to harden in, into its own brand of dogma and coercion, which right-wing demagogues are already exploiting. The democratic inclusion we want can be achieved only if we speak out against the intolerant climate that is set in on all sides. The free exchange of information and ideas, the lifeblood of a liberal society is daily becoming more constricted. While we have come to expect this on the radical right, censoriousness is also spreading more widely in our culture, an intolerance of opposing views, a vogue for public shaming and ostracism, and the tendency to dissolve complex policy issues in a blinding moral certainty. We uphold the value of robust and even caustic counter speech from all quarters. So they're doing a couple things there. One is, you know, saying that they're, they're not quite free speech absolutists, but they're as close to it as you can possibly get. And there's a big, big problem that's happening right now. So here's some of the specifics. Editors are being fired for running controversial pieces. Books are withdrawn for alleged inauthenticity. Journalists are barred from writing on certain topics. Professors are investigated for quoting works of literature in a class. A researcher is fired for circulating a peer-reviewed academic study. 
and heads of organizations are ousted for what are sometimes just clumsy mistakes. So we're going to look at, at some of that in a bit. Um, and then here's the speaking for the rest of us part. Now remember that the signatories of this letter are the, the people who are considered important enough to sign on to it, as, as one of the commentators wrote later on. The restriction of debate, whether by a repressive government or an intolerant society, invariably hurts those who lack power and makes everyone less capable of democratic participation. The way to defeat bad ideas is by exposure, argument, and persuasion, not trying to silence or wish them away. So there's a lot to be said about this, and we're going to come back to what, what you know, some of my views are on it and some of the other commentators' views are on it. But, you know, a few of you are pointing out it is quite flowery rhetoric, and, and it is. And it is rhetoric for the most part. So when we think about this issue of freedom of speech, right, it's something that is taken as a right. And that tends to be the, the, the main term that dominates the discourse on it. It's taken as a right by many. And if we're looking at this in a precise manner, really the biggest danger is, is not, you know, society, it's government right? That's the traditional way of, of looking at it. Um, if we want to talk about, you know, the First Amendment, the First Amendment doesn't have anything to say about your workplace or, you know, school or stuff like that. It's specifically about government interference with speech. And, you know, it's been given precision in the United States by the Supreme Court in ways that narrowed it considerably. Also in ways that, that expanded it considerably, where, you know, for example, uh, spending money on political campaigns by corporations is considered free speech and Citizens United. It also has a looser sense. And I think this is what they have in mind. And this is what most of us have in mind. Um, so going just to the First Amendment is kind of a non-starter most of the time, unless you plan to, like, argue a constitutional case. What do we have in mind most of the time? sort of like getting to say what you want without encountering any sort of repercussions or reprisals or censorship or shutdowns or things like that. And this, you know, little kids can operate with this concept and they say, you know, I'm on the playground and I call, you know, Timmy a, an idiot. That's my freedom of speech. Well, okay, then maybe there's something to that. But if that's all there is, just getting to blather on about whatever you want, I'm not sure that it's actually that that important of a of a issue. Usually, it gets framed in terms of all sorts of interesting ideological constructs. Um, you know, for example, the marketplace of ideas that people want to invoke all the time, and we're going to look at that in just a bit. Or totally open fields for discussion, or these you know uh, interminable conversations that go on and on and on. And, and those you know they may have some utility. Um, but they also, I think, um, obscure what's, what's going on a lot of the time. And you can frame it in a couple different ways. Now, somebody's you know, asking about Mill in here. Of course, we're going to talk about John Stuart Mill a bit, and right now is where we're going to do it. One way that you can frame free speech is in terms of rights. Everybody has a certain set of rights. Those rights end where other people's rights begin, and, and where those, those lines are is kind of hazy a lot of the time. And interestingly enough, people use their free speech to argue about why their free speech matters than other people's free speech or other people's rights, <laughs> for example, to safety or privacy or things like that. John Stuart Mill, one of the things that's really cool about On Liberty is he says, Okay, rights, that's fine. I'm not going to argue on that basis. I'm a utilitarian. I'm interested in what works out better for people in general. And so the arguments that I'm going to provide are not going to be based on my rights, you know, your rights or stuff like that, or some sort of deontological basis, you could say. Instead, we're going to see whether it's actually to the general benefit to allow as much free speech as possible. Free speech in... in not in a complete sense, because Mill certainly does acknowledge the uh, legitimacy of telling somebody, I don't want to have a conversation with you because you're a jerk. That's not impinging upon somebody's free speech. But he's, he's interested in whether it conduces to the general benefit to actually have something like an open forum, if you're not in a marketplace of ideas. 
And the other thing that I'll say that really predominates in the free speech discussions of today is what we might call a toughness or anti-snowflake motif, right? Everybody should be willing to hear everybody else out all the time, even if it's very noxious or hateful or done in bad faith. And that may be something that we would want to discuss uh, down, down the line. I think we should be really clear that a lot of speech, whether we think of it in terms of uh, writing or discussion or uh, you know political contributions here in the United States is actually not particularly edifying or on point or good or anything like that. It's it's you know generally the person who's saying something, unless they're just being a jerk or a troll or or you know anything along those lines, or trying to own the libs or own the conservatives or any sort of noxious antagonistic thing like that. Generally, they think what they have to say is good, but. Nobody else has to actually buy into that. And a lot of people, um, you know, say quite, quite foolish and stupid things. And the question is, should we, you know, should we be open to that? Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about this marketplace of ideas thing. We use this as a metaphor quite frequently. It's not a very good metaphor when you think about it. The idea is, you know, there's two basic ideas uh, to it. One is that in a marketplace, according to ideal theory about the way marketplaces work, which is not what we actually see in practice, the best ideas should you know, get market traction and the, and the worst ideas should, should go away um, because customers won't, won't buy them. You know, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. The other is that we ought to have the greatest variety of, of offerings, sort of like when you walk into the supermarket, it's not enough to have three flavors of spaghetti sauce. You need to have 26 or 108 or whatever the market will bear, right? So, um, you know, that's, that's part of what's behind this idea. I think that the marketplace of ideas notion ignores the way real marketplaces work and the way they intersect with the way in which we express things. If I walk into an actual place of business and just start spouting stuff, I'll, I'll get kicked out most likely. And if I try to appeal to, to free speech or say, oh, I, I have to be there to do it, um, I'll, I'll probably not get a, a good hearing from those, those people. And there's all sorts of other ways in which, you know, economic pressures come to bear on people. I, I know there's a lot of people who keep things under wraps um, because of their jobs. And it's not just, you know, because of the predominance of leftists in, in the, the university. All you actually got to do is spend a little bit of time in the university to realize that leftists don't actually run most universities. Uh, and, and similarly, you know, expressing extreme views within most corporate workplaces will get you in trouble unless the corporation heads, you know, agree with your political ideas. Another big problem with the marketplace of ideas notion is that, you know, a lot of speech drowns out other speech and whoever does have the biggest megaphone or the best way of articulating things to many, many people um, is probably going to benefit more from the marketplace than other people. Great example of this that just came up today, uh, Lady Antebellum the band decided to change its name to Lady A. There's already uh, an African-American artist who's been recording under that name for years and years and years. She found that in all of the, the streaming services, Lady Antebellum, now Lady A, pushed her totally out. So, you know, the marketplace might not be the best model for, for things. And we do have to ask ourselves, if we want to employ this, well, what's actually being bought and sold? What are the transactions? So it's not a really great metaphor. Another thing that we need to talk about is, is censorship. Um, people throw this term around rather loosely. Strictly speaking, censorship is when you're not allowing something to be said um, or when you're, you're punishing it afterwards. And it's typically on the part of the government uh, or part, you know, social institutions. We don't really talk about individuals censoring each other unless there's some sort of power relationship between them. I mean, we can talk about a boss censoring an employee in some sense, but most of the time that people use this word censorship, it's not really uh, censorship as, as such. The concept has been extended, however, in a number of different ways. So we can talk about people, you know, referring to censorship within institutions like a company, 
you know, oh, I can't say what I want within the workplace. Um, and there, you know, there are cases of, of, you know, if you if you try to unionize a lot of workplaces, you'll probably face some reprisals. And that's use of your your communication faculties to do that. Are they censoring you? It it, it really kind of depends. Um, news opinion sources, you know, they don't allow every single story to be published. Are they are they automatically censoring because of that? Schools, you know, uh, colleges, universities. Religious organizations, clubs, those are all places where people complain about censorship. They even complain about it within families or groups of friends. You know, I remember as a kid talking about, you know, my mom not letting me have freedom of speech. And actually, my kids have done that with me as well. When I say, we're done with this conversation, I've heard you, we're, we're not going to discuss this any further, right? I don't think that we should really call that censorship. And then we can also talk about social media platforms themselves. Now, this is where it gets really interesting these days, right? And this is where the cancel culture starts to fit in with it. We, we, all, we do need to distinguish between what platforms themselves do, and we're going to talk about that a bit more in a bit, and what groups, individuals who are not, you know, the ones who run the platform but are using the platform do. So, you know, for example, when Twitter, uh, you know, signals that that some of uh, Trump's tweets are dubious. It's not quite censoring, even though they called it that. It's it's doing something else because you can still see the tweet, right? If they actually kick somebody off of a platform altogether, okay, I think you can talk then about something like censoring. And we can have some debate about whether deplatforming, it really is censoring or not. Given that the same information can easily be placed in other other uh, venues. Um, I don't think that what individuals are doing in blocking and calling out or stuff like that is actually censoring on social media platforms, but we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. Now this leads into another consideration. So if I have free speech and you have free speech and I say things that you don't like or things that are actually hurtful and hateful to you, you can use your free speech to respond to me. And if I'm going to cry about it afterwards and say, oh, I, I shouldn't face those sort of reprisals, I'm being a bit hypocritical, aren't I? Um, this is an issue that goes all the way back to Plato's Cratylus. If, if, you, you know, if you haven't read that dialogue, most people don't, it's well worth reading. It's all about language. And one of the things that Plato says in there that's really interesting, he brings the conversation around to legislation. Laws are language, you know, writing somebody up and firing them after you know, three write-ups, that is a use of language. All of these things fall within the purview, not just of action, but of language, of speech, of communication. And so the question that we often want to ask is, well, where does something that's a speech act slide into being a, an act act, right? So, um, you know, we might think about calling for somebody to be fired. Is that actually a, an action or is that more a, a, an act of communication? Um, if I have the, the, you know, the capacity to offend you, then you have the capacity to claim that I should be, you know, censured in some sort of way. No, notice I said censured, not censored, right? Which are two different things. Um, and here's where we get to another thing that's quite interesting to think about from the utilitarian perspective. And this is where Mill is coming from in part. So Jeremy Bentham, the founder of utilitarianism, enunciated something that I think is quite common across the board in, in 17th and 18th century and also 19th century ideas about the way that um, communication and um, action ought to, to work in terms of politics and culture. So there's something that develops that we can call the public sphere or, or publicity. And this is where public opinion becomes important. And before the internet, of course, back in that time, it's communicated through pamphlets and books and letters and, you know, discussions in coffee houses or taverns or, or things like that, as well as remonstrances with the government. And there's this understanding on, on Bentham's part that sanctions get imposed on people for engaging in what he calls antisocial behavior, or which can also sometimes just be you know, selfish behavior. 
And among the sanctions that he talks about are, you know, the physical sanction, and then he talks about the political sanction. The political sanction is when the government actually uses force against you and, and you know, say confiscates your goods or something like that. Then he also talks about the social, and he changes his, 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 his views on this, or the, the language from one text to the, to, to, the, to the next over the course of his career, he calls it the social or the moral sanction. And this is when, you know, because you're a jerk, your neighbors don't want to talk to you. Um, you're being sanctioned, and you're being sanctioned for being, you know, uh, kind of a, a jerk to other people. Um, and, you know, Bentham sees a fundamental difference between this, and so did most people in the 18th century. If I choose not to engage with you economically, if I choose to tell other people not to engage with you economically, uh, provided I'm not doing it just to be a malicious jerk, there's a certain legitimacy to that in you know all of this this thought. And and Mill similarly views things that way as well. It's not just a free for all of of speech. There are consequences to it. So if you're going to demand free speech for yourself, then you also have to accord free speech to others. And that free speech to others might be offensive to you, or it might in fact impinge upon your business interests or affect whether you get into a particular college or university or not, or hold a job or things like that. And I think that a lot of what's missing in these free speech discussions is, you know, basic principle of prudence in, in thinking about one's own position. And I'm going to be very crude here. Um, when I was a kid, I was, you know, I, I, I got in all sorts of trouble. And I remember when I was a ward of the court and I was in this place called shelter care uh, because of the, the amount of trouble that I'd gotten into, I was being a jerk to some of the staff and they didn't want to talk to me. And then after I, I was you know, upset about this, I was like, how come you talk to that guy and you don't talk to me? And I remember one of them got in my face and he said, I'm going to make it super clear to you, Greg, act like an asshole, get treated like an asshole. And I think that should be like the model for a lot of, uh, exercises of free speech. If you <clears throat> go on the attack, don't be surprised that other people go on the attack against you, you know? Um, and, you know, there, there's probably need to be some limits to that, and we'll, we'll talk about that more in the discussion. But I think that that's something that's missing a lot. We also live in a time when reproduction and reframing of these, let's call them agonistic uh, interactions, they're super easy to do in social media, and then you can cut, you can like do a screenshot, you can do copy and pasting, and so we live in a different time. You know, in, in the past, if you said something <clears throat> off color at a, a barbecue, right, and it was all your friends around, maybe nobody was actually paying that much attention to it. Now you could be recorded at any time, and so a lot of people feel very worried about that, like, oh, well, what's what's going to come out of my mouth? You know, what's going to happen? And, and this is, there is a legitimate concern here when we look at, you know, the transformation of, of, of sort of normative lines. But we could have been wrong in the past, and maybe there's a lot of stuff that we let fly that actually, looking back on it, was quite wrong to do. Uh, I think that what's, what's going on right now is people are actually looking for accountability in terms of what people what other people are saying. And so this is where, you know, I'm, I'm going to bring in my own views. It looks like I am going to go over a little bit. I'll, I'll probably wrap this up around the half an hour time. So my own views about social media, because this has been something that a lot of people have brought up here and there. Um, I think we have a, a, a big issue that we should talk about another time about platforms. What are they? You know, what is Twitter? What is Facebook? Are they just private companies? Are they media aggregators or publishers? Are they public utilities? I'm going to put that aside for right now. What I'm going to say is this, banning, blocking people, calling them out on stuff, uh, fact-checking them, that is not actually censoring people uh, because they can go elsewhere and they, they have a platform elsewhere. There's a lot of different possibilities. It's not like there's only one social media place in town. I think a lot of people are worried about their economic basis, right? Particularly those who are earning a ton of money from, say, YouTube or uh, ad revenue or things like that. But here's my view. I'm going to put aside sort of the public issue and talk about, you know, groups, pages, uh, YouTube channels, interactions like that. 
I think that one's own spaces in pub and social media are exactly that one's own spot. And it's up to moderators or content producers to do whatever they want with it. So if I'm posting on, you know, the classic metal group, something like, Hey, um, metal sucks. I can expect to encounter a lot of resistance and I can expect perhaps if I'm going to be a jerk to get kicked out of that group and banned. Uh, and I think that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and you could make an argument that it's better to engage the jerks or the misguided or something like that, or that people like that have a right to be heard or express themselves. And, and my answer to that, so those are two separate issues. The first one is an issue of time and merit. You know, we each get 24 hours a day. I probably field anywhere, and I'm, I'm a, a small fish in the social media pond. If you think about Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook, I probably respond to at least 30 people a day in one way or another. And the question is, well, who actually merits a conversation and who doesn't? Now, you know, somebody just some random person popping in because they were upset about how I tweaked their ideological, uh, you know, heartstrings or something like that. I don't actually have an obligation to engage with them or enlighten them or anything like that. As a matter of fact, I, I created some videos where I just post them and I'm like, hey, you can go Google that or, uh, you know, uh, here's, here's my standard response to that, right? Um, let's see. Bernard says you're a middle-sized fish, I'd say. No, I'm, I'm actually a small fish when it comes to, like, say, most of these, these things. But um, the other thing about giving everybody a space. There's no obligation for me to give anybody a space on my channel or in my Twitter feed or on my Facebook page because there's a million other ones that they can go to. It's not like I control a scarce resource that, um, you know, I'm, I'm doling out, you know, to only to my cronies or something like that. And I think that we should look at these spaces as being something like somebody's front porch or their backyard. You get to be there if you're not a jerk. If, if they want to kick you out, they kick you out. So um, the exceptions, I, and I do think there could be some exceptions, would be people who create forums that are uh, created for the purpose of totally open discussion, where they declare that to be the purpose. Now, they would be hypocritical if they're not doing that. Let's move on to cancel culture. So canceling. What, what actually is canceling? There's a variety of different forms. I'm going to kind of skip over this. Um, economic, you know, we can talk about firing people, blackballing them, not buying products, destroying products like when conservatives were, were burning up their, their Nike stuff, you know, uh, socially not inviting people to things, ostracizing them uh, in terms of media, not watching a person's products or calling for a show to be ended or somebody to be kicked off a show or, you know, like gotten, you know, gotten out of uh, media products like we, people did with Kevin Spacey. Social media, publishing, we can talk about deplatforming people, piling on them, doxing. Um, intellectually, we can say, you know, maybe cancel culture extends to not taking people seriously, saying this person's an idiot, don't listen to them, right? Um, now, canceling is, a, is really a broader set of topics that are all connected together, I think. And, and I really think that cancel culture is not something new. And, and there's, you know, people have talked about pearl clutching when it comes to um, conservatives recently talking about cancel culture and these uh, mostly liberals and leftists talking about cancel culture in the Harper's letter. And I think that's actually quite dead on. Pearl clutching is when you're, you're claiming that something is a big problem right now and, and it's, it's actually... It's been around for a long time. And so there's a few things I wanted to read from uh, some of the, the suggested uh, or recommended readings. So here's uh, Michael Hobbs. He said, for decades, American, American media was controlled by a tiny number of gatekeepers. Count up all the top editors of all the national news outlets in the pre-internet era, you would have gotten a shockingly small number. Uh, if, they, if that tiny group of editors decided an opinion was not worthy of being heard, it wasn't. And that's the case in so many institutions, not just back then, but today. Now, there was a lot of canceling going on back then. All you had to do is say the wrong thing, and it gets to one of those people, or be the wrong kind of person, and you're never going to get published, right? And so the internet has really opened things up for us. Um, 
Zai Jilani wrote, uh, in their attempts to remedy the most pernicious aspects of cancel culture, critics have mostly concentrating on advocating less punitive social norms. That's good as it goes. So she's you know, say, saying there is cancel culture, but here's, here's one of the big problems. Maybe the employment aspect wouldn't be such a big problem if we didn't have all this crazy at will employment, right? If we were more like the Europeans who you actually have, a good, have to have a good reason to fire somebody, not just uh, they happen to have said something bad on social media. It's worth considering. Myself, I'd really like to see some consistency from those complaining about cancel culture. And I don't demand perfect consistency, uh, but at least something showing that they're communicating in, in relatively good faith. So if you're complaining about cancel culture and you're on the left and you're only targeting conservatives, uh, I think that's kind of bullshit. And I likewise think that uh, from people on the right, that, that it's kind of bullshit. Um, you know, I also think that relying on just a few anecdotes, which is what the letter did, is really problematic. Um, great example of this is, you know, anybody who's actually spent much time in academic institutions and didn't go in as a pure ideologue knows that there's not a lot of indoctrination taking place because it's hard as hell to indoctrinate the students just to read the friggin' texts, right, and to do the work. Uh, let alone indoctrinate them into some overarching Marxist conspiracy. That's all just that. That's all just you know fever dream nonsense dreamt up by conservatives who who get into that sort of thing. There are a few places where you can find something remotely like that, but I can tell you, and I teach at quite a few places around here, it ain't like that. Um, so I think we have to be really quite. Um, you know, I think we have to be uh, quite, quite careful about those sorts of things. And, you know, here's, here's a, one of my other suggestions. I'm actually going to stop so I can, so I'm not going to talk about all the different things I wanted to get to because I want to answer some of these questions. I think that free speech, you know, you can regard it as a right if you want to, and you can make that the, the focus of your discourse. I think that talking about rights without responsibilities has been one of the big problems here in America. And I think that, you know, we've, We've seen that in other places in the world as well. Um, it's one thing to insist that other people give you a hearing. I think that introduces another uh, requirement that you give a good faith hearing to other people as well and that you respect some boundaries and that you don't, uh, you know, lie or distort. Or, and so there's what we might call communicational or, you know, epistemological norms built into free speech. And I think a lot of people will disagree with me on that, but that's, that's, that's my view on it. So there's lots and lots of people who have written things in here. I'm going to scroll up to the top and um, see what people have to say. Remember, keep your comments relevant and civil to other people in here. Um, Callum says, ironic that those complaining about cancel culture costing people their jobs, like Milo, Shapiro, Jordan Peterson, have literally built careers from it. I think some have. Um, Shapiro's a, a particularly, you know, good example of that um, because he, he sent internet mobs after people on different occasions. And I think that we should be wary. I think that the, the higher up the person is, the more wary we should be about their complaints about cancel culture. I'm not saying that, that we need to romanticize the, you know, the little person uh, at the bottom, but I think there's a lot more bullshit about cancel culture the further up that we go. All right. Um, let's see. Reed, 52, what are your thoughts on removing statues of people like Thomas Jefferson with his mixed legacy. Personally, I don't actually have much problem with, with removing statues. I think the whole, like we learn history from them idea is, is stupid and bullshit. And you know, that anybody who actually has to look at a statue instead of reading a book has got some serious issues. I mean, we're not back in the middle ages where the cathedrals were Bibles in stone. You know, we, we have a, a literate society and, um, you know, I mean, if you if you can't see a picture of Thomas Jefferson in your hometown, you can go on the internet and find them easily. Um, I think that you know we need to when we're talking about statues, uh, the ones that are being there, there's really like two classes of statues being pulled down. There's the people who are clearly egregious bad people, 
you know, and, and, and were allowed to be glorified for one reason or another. And they've been pulling those statues down. And then there's one where it's more mixed cases, right? Um, personally, would I pull a statue of Thomas Jefferson down? No. But do I care if Thomas Jefferson's statue gets pulled down? Not much. Uh, I think there's bigger fish to fry. Um, but, you know, you, and you can hear what I have to say about Confederate statues on the interview that I did with Tom Ritchie a long time about that. Uh, Mark says, I feel that the Harper's letter was too vague to be of any use. I think it's, it, it can be used ideologically. And, and the reason piece that I suggested is a great example of that. Where um, and there was another one as well in the the four reactions where they're saying can't you know the, this this cancel culture is going after the letter now so I think I think it it can be of use ideologically. Jacob says I read and liked the open letter. I think cancel culture is a major danger. Have you experienced observed cancel culture in your own academic career? Yeah, I mean I actually had a. a person I was working with on a translation project who tried to get me fired. And luckily the, the dean told that person to go, you know, basically take a long walk off a short pier. Um, and I, I've seen, you know, people bringing up all sorts of frivolous bullshit complaints and then sometimes some real legitimate complaints. The, the bad thing is that it's hard to get legitimate complaints taken seriously within academia. You know, we have these egregious um, sexual harassers who were, you know, people, you know, knew about them and they tell female graduate students, avoid them. Thomas Poga, for example, John Searle and the university would cover for them. I don't think I don't think that, you know, so with, with, with a few exceptions, I don't think that cancel culture is the big problem that people are making it out to be. I mean, I don't see an awful lot of evidence of it working the way that the people concerned about it are uh, are uh, saying. So a lot of that is, is sort of imagination uh, on their part, I think. Um, Bradford, studying Mein Kampf is not a crime, for example. No, it, it's, it's not a crime. Um, as a matter of fact, I think that it's worth actually looking at Mein Kampf so you can see the uh, sort of lines of reasoning that uh, people like Hitler are, are spouting, and then you can identify them with people on the right today and say, holy crap, <laughs> this is like straight out of the playbook, you know? Um, I also think that you should read Charles Murat, you know, instead of just, you know, talking about Steve Bannon and what he has to say, he's basically a, a replication of this guy who started Action Francaise, a proto-fascist organization uh, that came out of the Dreyfus Affair in France, I think we should read this stuff. I'm not saying that we, we should lock up the books or anything, um, but that's not what cancel culture or free speech is really centering around now, is it? All right. Um, let's see. Oh, so here's another interesting thing about Mein Kampf, right? I have a copy of Mein Kampf I've read from, but I definitely don't display it prominently on my bookshelf. Okay, that, that's, that's a, a significant point. Um, now, why not display it prominently on your bookshelf? Because the very act of displaying it would probably lead people to think that you not only are studying it, but that you think that it's, it's a good work, right? And that you're endorsing it in some way. This is why in Twitter, a lot of people put in their Twitter profile, retweets are not endorsements because there, I suppose there's a natural human tendency to think that um, people who are bringing something up are bringing it up because they like it. And so I want to say two points about that because that's, that's really quite interesting. And so these are, these are a bit of a, a digression. One is that on a personal level, I often run into people who, because I cover such a wide range of thinkers and I do so sympathetically, where they will say, oh, man, I thought you were Nietzschean because you, you present on Nietzsche, or I thought you were uh, a, you know, a Hegelian, or I thought you were a Stoic, or stuff like that. And I suppose there's this natural human tendency to think, well, if you're presenting about it, it must be because you think it's important uh, and it's worth, worth engaging with. And I think for a lot of people, that is the way that they do things. They only talk about stuff that they think is, is good, unless they want to talk condemningly about stuff that they think is bad, right? But that's not the way it works in academia, and that's not the way it works in sort of higher level opinion discussions that fit into what we were calling earlier the public sphere. And that's not necessarily the way it works even on social media. 
Um, so that's 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 one aspect of that. The other aspect about the uh, endorsing. So you could say that like putting a photograph of your bookshelf is in a way a communicative act, right? Communication doesn't just have to do with what comes out of your mouth or what you type, you know, tippy tap type on your typewriter or your keyboard or what you say in a video, which I guess is coming out of your mouth too, but um, what you surround yourself with. And this is where we have to be quite careful in the judgments that we, we make about, about people. Um, you know, there is guilt by association a lot of the time. All right. Um, let's see here. Here's a, here's a question that I think is, is a good one. Philosophy and critical thinking. Do I think that contrasting the different kinds of freedom, such as positive and negative freedom, is helpful in discussing freedom of speech? So let's, let's talk about what the distinction between positive and negative freedom amounts to. Uh, and one of the classical places to go to this is Isaiah Berlin, the two concepts of liberty, right? That's what I need to do some core concepts about because people ask me about it all the time. Um, and I should start teaching it in my classes. So negative freedom is freedom from, and positive freedom is freedom for. That's the slogan that usually goes with that. Negative freedom is essentially saying other people should not prevent you from something. So freedom of speech is usually viewed as a negative freedom, right? You shouldn't have, <coughs> excuse me, you shouldn't have anybody else restricting what it is that you say. Positive freedom does fit in with speech, though. Positive freedom is the capacity to develop towards something good for yourself or, say, a set of relationships or um, something else. Um, you know, it's often associated with what we call perfectionism in ethics, meaning this, this notion that there is, like, a definite human nature to be realized and we ought to do what we can to try to realize or perfect it. So in saying, for example, that human beings are social creatures and we ought to live in harmony with each other, that's a positive ideal. And we could say that, that you know, freedom of speech can certainly conduce to that, but I don't think that freedom of speech per se pertains to that, if that, if that helps you. All right. Um, let's see here. A lot of back and forth stuff. Um, literally Dasein. Here's an interesting question. This is actually a really good one. Can we consider how good is an idea based on the way it is presented? So that can, that can mean a lot of different things. But I think there's something important there. Um, you know, and again, Mills on Liberty, which is sort of a, a locus classicus, right, for for uh, freedom of speech discussions, he talks about limiting intemperate discussions. And there, there were a lot of people who were like, listen, I'm cool with hearing stuff that I think is wrong or I don't want to hear, but I don't want it said at me like in such a uncivil way, in, in a threatening way or, or a angry way or stuff like that, right? I don't want to be name called. And um, Mill actually comes down on the side of saying, well, it's really hard to police that. Um, I'm not going to, you know, say that that we should start restricting things based on how they're expressed. I don't agree with him on that. I think that there's many different ways to get your point across. You know, if you think about um, uh, John Lennon's uh, quip, you know, if you go around carrying pictures of Chairman Mao, you're not going to make it with anyone anyhow. Um, okay, that's that's right. If you want to be in your face and be a jerk to people, um, don't be surprised if they're a jerk to you. And if if you are, you know, uh, culturally insensitive because you didn't take the time to actually learn about other people, or you're coming from a very privileged position, uh, and other people call you out on it, I don't have much sympathy for that, quite frankly. Um, I know I've been, I, I've certainly had my share of, of getting that sort of stuff in my face over the years. Uh, from being a kid on, um, but yeah, the way in which we express things, I think, does matter. And you know, this, so remember how I was talking about 
rights, responsibility. You know, when you, when the whole stress is on my right to say what I want, and there's no like thinking about is there is there a better way for me to express this? Do I have a responsibility to actually engage with my interlocutors in good faith? Um, that's when we run into a lot of problems. So that, that's a great question. Um, all right. Uh, Here's a good a good point from Aid and rights are one thing. The ability and degree to which you can use them is another. Yeah, um, and this is where we get to you know a lot of these free speech things. You know, not everybody has the same same platform for free speech, do they? You know, when I was saying I'm kind of a little fish, uh, and if you look at you know like the scale of of people on YouTube or Twitter, um, there's a, there's a cool thing you can look up called philosophers on Twitter. I'm down there in the like 130s, you know. There's some people where if they say something, uh, tens of thousands of people are are seeing it in their stream right away. There's there's pages in in Facebook, uh, and the you know even for just philosophy stuff, where you have access to 50,000 people, right? Or YouTube channels where there are millions of subscribers, rather than um, I'm not even at 100,000 yet. And I'm, you know, from the perspective of a lot of my, my viewers and stuff, I'm, you know, kind of up there. But that's because they don't see how, how many other layers there are as well. We don't all have access to the same platforms. And a lot of the locking down of free speech happens at the expense of people who are closer to the bottom than people who are closer to the top. I mean, the people who are closer to the top can usually find another venue to bitch about how they've been censored, can't they? But unless the unless the ordinary person's experience somehow fits into some left wing or, or right wing or some other narrative, usually nobody else pays attention to them, right? I mean, uh, uh, you know, there there are some ex exceptions to that, but I think that's that's a really important point. Um, let's see here. Um, here's a good one from Colin Sharp. How do we preserve the right to speech in a meaningful democracy when some voices are privileged more than the others, megaphone size being marginalized, et cetera? So that's, that's tying in with what I was just talking about. But there, there it's asking about, well, what do we do? So one thing we could do if we're in platforms that allow us to do this, is to amplify the speech of those who don't have um, big accounts. You know, we we use our slightly larger account to amplify them, and we don't um, maybe necessarily amplify what Nike has to say or what you know uh, this celebrity has to say. You know, a way to do that on Twitter is you screenshot uh, the person's tweet, and instead of actually, like, retweeting their tweet, you, you tweet the, the screenshot of it with your commentary above. I think there's ways to do this. Um, one of the things I really like about Twitter is that I can, you know, because of the way I follow people and the way that I unfollow and block and stuff like that, I, have, I get a really good feed with a lot of cool people who have interesting things to say that are not necessarily within, you know, the, the normal spectrum of the mainstream and they're not like movers and shakers in, in the traditional or social media. Um, and I wind up benefiting as, as a result of that. So I don't know. I think that's a, a much bigger discussion to, to be had. Um, let's see here. Aiden, if you spout blind leftist stuff in a university tutorial, people call you out on it. It's, it's so blown up that the universities are blind leftist bubbles. Yeah, that, that's that's exactly the case. Um, if you go into, I mean, if you go into most uh, professors' classes and you just, you know, make a bunch of talking points, the professors are not usually too happy about that. Professors 
are not usually people who are just ideologues and are like, it's all got to be my way. Because, you know, academia doesn't, doesn't attract that sort. I mean, there are some like that, of course. Um, I mean, where you find a lot more conformity of thought is in the corporate world, you know. And I, you know, being somebody who's moved in a lot of different di sectors, um, that's where I see way more groupthink um, is in a lot of corporations than in, in academic uh, institutions. Um, let's see. John wants to claim they are overwhelmingly cultural leftists nonetheless, especially those in administrative roles. No. <laughs> that, that is so false. Uh, administrators are usually the ones who are union busting, who are, you know, uh, trying to cut costs as much as possible. Um, they may have a thin veneer of progressive causes to them, but no. <laughs> With, again, very rare exceptions, that's not the case. Um, all right, let's see here. Gutter Grown says, I'm with Charles L. Lawrence, the third on his view that some hate speech is fighting words based on the normative valuation. For example, the N-word. Um, you know, I, I'd go along with that. I think there, I mean, to begin with, if one wants to use hateful epithets, uh, there, there's usually a good point where somebody should pause and say, is this really what I want to say? What are my motives for doing this? And I think if people are honest with themselves and they don't lie to themselves about, you know, their free speech or how important it is to like, you know, the, get to use these words or something like that. I think in a lot of cases, people would be like, oh, yeah, uh, this is going to hurt somebody else. And it, it, whether it hurts their feelings or is a microaggression or, you know, calls back to trauma, I don't think it really matters. You know, if you're if you're deliberately saying things that, you know, are going to be hurtful and hateful to people and you don't have some good reason for doing so, you're an asshole. That's all there is to it. And if you do it in certain areas, I mean, imagine going into some parts of uh, Milwaukee, which is one of the most segregated cit large cities in the United States, and you know, walking down the street and deliberately using the N-word, and then somebody coming up to you and clocking you. I, you know, I would say, okay, so they probably shouldn't have hit you, but you are an idiot. And you should have seen that coming as well, you know. Um, and I think there's a lot of things like that, you know. And, and it's some people say, "Oh, we're being too sensitive," you know. Uh, it was okay to use this word before, or that in that group uses that word themselves. And, and so much of this, to me, is is like get over it. We have an English language that is one of the richest in vocabulary in the world, you know, in part because we took loan words from so many. You can communicate what you need to communicate without that. I mean, it's sort of like, this is a different issue, uh, the use of profanity, right? The F word, or, you know, where people are like, F and this, F and that. You know, we joke about it, and we're like, you know, uh, the F word can be a noun, a verb, an adverb, an, an adjective. It's so, you know, so useful. It's useful if you really don't have anything much to say other than, oh, blah, 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 you know? Um, articulate people can actually say things in a variety of different ways, you know? So, uh, you know, uh, that's a little bit off topic there, but all right. Um, oh, Nish Nishant says, can we speak about the specifics in the letter? Is there something that happened recently that triggered this letter? So, yeah, like I mentioned, there's that section where they are talking about specific cases, right? that they want to bring up. And so editors are fired for running controversial pieces, right? So uh, the editor of the New York Times uh, resigned after bringing Tom Cotton in to, to write this fever dream of totalitarianism that was his piece, right? And a lot of people are like, this is really, you know, I mean, the Times is, is slipping. I mean, now I'm gonna actually do a little rant here. Personally, I think the Times has been garbage most of my life. Uh, it's, it's never been any better than, say, the Chicago Tribune or the, uh, you know, when it was good, the uh, Milwaukee Sentinel, you know. Um, I think that, that a lot of people give way too much credence to these, these uh, top 
tier uh, opinion formers uh, when they're really just you know replicating elite culture and, and their sentiments and it's it's a very narrow group of people who, who get in there and get to get to use that megaphone. Uh, now be that as it may, um, it was a stupid thing to do, and they you know a lot of people like were weighed in and they were like, here's my piece that the, that the Times uh, didn't publish, and uh, what do you think of that? They published this instead of this. So you know that's one of those cases where there were a lot of bad editorial decisions that went into it. Um, books are withdrawn for alleged inauthenticity. I wonder if that's Naomi Wolf's book, perhaps. Um, journalists are banned from writing on certain topics. Okay, that's, that's uh, quite true. That happens in a lot of newsrooms. That's been going on for decades, if not centuries. Uh, professors are investigated for quoting works of literature in class. Okay, that, so there was a case where that actually did happen. Um, and, you know, there's, there's some things where you probably ought to say before you do it, listen, there's a use mention distinction. <laughs> Here's where I'm going to do the, the mentioning thing. Uh, a research is fired for fu circulating a peer-reviewed academic study. Um, there's a couple cases like that out there. And heads of organizations are ousted for what are sometimes just clumsy mistakes. Hey, if you're a head of an organization, you don't get to make dumb mistakes. You're, you know, if, if you are liable to make dumb mistakes, you don't have a Twitter, Right. You don't have a social media presence because you're ahead of an organization. So, you know, that, that's, that's my views on that. Uh, but again, when you, when you take little bits of anecdotes and put them together into a great constellation, um, you ever look at the night sky and look at constellations? You're like, okay, I can see Orion there. I sure as hell can't see a club and hair on his head and stuff like that. That's what a narrative is compared to the little stars that are the anecdotes. So... All right, uh, Bradford Gers says, I think asking for someone to be fired for their speech is ven vengeful more than correcting. So that's a, that's a good topic to explore. It really depends on what they're getting fired from and what the conditions are. So for example, telling police departments that this, this person right here has white power tattoos on them and um, beats their wife and did these things off duty, they should not be on the police force. I don't see any problem with that. As a matter of fact, if we want to uh, resolve some of the problems of policing, we need to get rid of uh, probably about a third to half of the people that are on police forces right now because we have a lot of bad apples. And then maybe they can get retrained and rehired later. You know, they don't have to be like blackballed for forever. But um, there are a lot of people who are totally unfit to be given authority and weapons and stuff like that. Um, likewise, CEOs of corporations, hey, if you're the CEO, the buck stops with you. If you say something stupid on social media and people call for you to get fired and the board fires you, tough shit. You know, that should be, that's where at will employment ought to be. The higher you go up, the more at will it ought to be, I think. If you're, you know, the electrician who is cracking his knuckles and somebody thinks it's a white power sign, okay, that's a real problem. And there's a petition to get the guy rehired, right, in that case. Um, and he probably will be rehired. If somebody's mean to you at Walmart because they're having a bad day and they're the cashier, um, maybe you actually are the Karen regardless of whether you're male, female, you know, or whatever race you happen to be when you complain to the manager and want to get them fired, right? That, that's, that's different. So I, I don't think that we can say across the board that um, asking for someone to be fired for their speech is, is more vengeful than, than correcting. I think in a lot of cases, people do, in fact, learn by losing their jobs. And if we think about a lot of the jobs that people are doing, where they can move from one to the next. Again, we'll talk about police, right? There, a lot of the problem cops out there have been fired from multiple departments and then rehired by the one next, you know, down the road. Um, and we can think of many other things like that as well, unfortunately, in the professions. Um, losing your job, it really depends on what your circumstances are. There's a lot of people who are going to have no problem going out and getting another job or they're going to be on all sorts of talk shows and, and earning that money and getting a book deal out of being, you know, discriminated against for their, their firing. 
So I, I think we have to be very, we have to be case by case almost with, with the, this sort of thing. All right. Um, Richard Simpson says, in these times, because things are so polarizing and volatile, better just not to speak about politics at work. It can destroy relationships and cohesiveness. So there is something to that. And I, and I do know people who keep their, their politics under wrap at work. And, I, you know, when it comes down to me, um, there are situations in which I think it's appropriate to bring up your politics and other situations in which it's irrelevant or, or you know, unproductive to bring it up, right? Uh, and this is where exercising prudence comes in. And again, free speech understood not just as a right, but as a sense of, you know, responsibility as well. Uh, the people who think that they ought to be able to spout whatever they want, whenever they want, um, there's a real sense of entitlement going along with that. Uh, now, does that mean that in every situation we ought to, like in the old days, we say, well, what, are, what, what don't you discuss at the dinner table? It was always... Uh, uh, sex, religion, money, or politics, right? You pick three out of that. I don't think we have to go that far, but we probably should be a bit more circumspect about putting everything out there. And there, there's a lot of people who say, well, but I feel so strongly about this. Well, okay, that's you can feel strongly about whatever you want. It can be that the nation is going to hell and we need you know, to wear red hats in order to fix it and have rallies or, you know, and have jets flying overhead, uh, and we better salute the flag, or it could be, well, we need to protest and, you know, change the, cor the composition of police forces, and could be anything in between, right? Could be that graduate students at Marquette ought to, to, ought to have a union, ought to be given a lot more protection and benefits than they, they currently are, which I happen to believe. Uh, it could be whatever you want, and maybe, there are venues to talk about that, and then there's others where you you don't have to do that. Uh, this this you know this notion that it's so all or nothing. It's it's a. I know there's a lot of people who feel that way, but again, I want to say prudence or practical wisdom is really something that we, we need to have. All right, uh, Bradford, being offended is a fat is a part of life. I think that's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that I, I want to develop, by the way, is total digression. So at Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design, I have a lot of latitude in the classes that I suggest and, and offer, much more than I do at, say, Milwaukee Area Technical Institute, uh, MATC, Milwaukee Area Technical College, or at uh, Marquette, where they just say, you, you get these classes. Um, one of the classes I really want to develop is like a class about how to productively argue and discuss things with people who you don't agree with and how to develop at least kind of a, a, a thicker skin or more, um, more flexible way of, of dealing with people who do offend you, you know, and being able to tell the people who are going to keep on offending you because they're really jerks and they get something out of it, or they're sadists, and the people who crossed a line and don't realize it and now are really embarrassed, and you can reach, right? I think those are important distinctions. Lyndon, glad to see you here. Uh, there's the matter of a mood of intolerance, if not censorship itself, but everyone has their triggers. We don't have a responsibility to take ridiculous or noxious ideas seriously. Yeah, I think there's, we can talk about there being kind of norms when it comes to that. Not every idea is worth entertaining, um, and not every um, "you have offended me" claim has the same weight or merit as every other one. I think, um, and I think we do have to be careful about sort of ascribing um, what would you call it? You know. I mean, it's the thing that people who are concerned about identity politics do fear, which does happen sometimes where you're like, well, this person gets to be offended because they belong to this group. Um, and and their, you know, being offended matters more than anybody else. I think we do have to be careful about that. But um, I think that there's a lot of like learning about what, what, what does offend other people that needs to go on. I'm always super surprised at people who say something um, bigoted or 
you know, ignorant or hurtful. And then they're like, well, I didn't know that that bothered people. And I'm like, how the hell do you not know that? What, what rock have you been living under that you don't know that saying this is going to offend these people over here? But I guess there's a lot of uh, ignorance out there. So maybe there is some, some value to like, you know, doing more, um, you know, informational stuff about, you know, what not to say and why not to say it, why, why it's offensive. Um, philosophy and critical thinking, it may be an apocryphal, but I think Winston Churchill said some people's idea of freedom of speech is that anyone can say what they want, but if anyone says anything back, it's an outrage. Yeah, I think there's a lot of that going on. I think a lot of the complaints about cancel culture, somebody's not actually being canceled, but they, they use it as sort of a, a prop to gain sympathy for themselves and to also to attack back the person who said something that they don't like. Um, oh, here's an interesting question from J.A. Should YouTube even be the public sphere in the first place? Is Twitter an apt public sphere? Um, I don't think that we get to decide those sorts of things in any sort of rational way. And so this is, this is actually a really great question. So going back historically, I think there have always been people who are like, these pamphlets, these broadsheets that are being circulated around, they go over the line. They say outrageous things. Look at them being hammered and nailed uh, on the public, uh, you know, walls or something like that. This is outrageous, you know. And now we'd be like, I mean, you, you walk around places where it says post no bills and it's covered with stuff. And it's not mostly political stuff. It's usually like this band or the, this DJ and, and things like that. Um, we just sort of take it for granted. Same thing with so many other things. Like when radio came out, it was viewed as such a disruptive social force. You know, you, you read like uh, Gabriel Marceau, who I'm a big fan of, talking about how radio lends itself to, you know, uh, totalitarian society. And after a while, you're like, okay, I see how they did use it in totalitarian societies. I think that the, that, that worry has been overblown. I think we're stuck with the public sphere that we get and it, and it continually develops. And Twitter is part of that, man. You know, Twitter is, is really quite interesting because um, if you think about, I got to fix my, my hair is starting to pull out of the thing. If you think about like compared to Facebook, right? Facebook has more users, but who do the, the news uh, and opinion shows on like the cable news networks, who do they go to and who have they gone to for the last 10 years? Twitter. They, they feel that Twitter is somehow more important. And so you can put stuff on there and, and your tweets can get into somebody's uh, opinion program. Or um, you see people posting them in, in, uh, you know, blog posts, right, or, or uh, um, write-ups in, in, say, uh, newspaper articles. Um, so I, I think we're kind of stuck with <clears throat> Twitter, and I think we're stuck with YouTube. What's interesting is that there's a lot of other smaller, um, sometimes rival things that want to become their own public, their own public um, sphere things like Gab was going to, you know, replace Twitter, and it doesn't seem like it's managed to do <clears throat> do that well with that. I don't know that there is any real rival to YouTube. I mean, you could say Daily Motion, but or, or Vimeo, but th those don't really have that much traction either. Um, so I think I think we're kind of stuck with those, and we have to theorize about well, what 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 happens with Twitter, and how should we think about it. Um, let's see here. Gooder Groan says ostracism is a social control. Yeah. And, and, you know, traditional ostracism means like you're literally cast out of the city or cast out of the political community or social community altogether. Um, that's pretty rare these days. Usually it's like somebody's pushed off of this platform and then they appear somewhere else and they're not, they can always find somebody to hang out with. It's, it's rare to find people who've been like totally ostracized. Um, 
Bradford Gers, I tell my daughter the same thing. If you're a jerk, people won't like you and you lose friends. <laughs> I'm sorry that, that you and your daughter are going through that, but it's a part of the learning process. Uh, hopefully your daughter is not as hard headed as I was as a kid. Um, yeah, I, I think that this is, this is actually part of the maturation process. The part of the process of turning into a genuine, fully developed human being is often realizing that you have been a jerk and that you need to like start fixing those parts of yourself and that other people enabling you and telling you that it was okay. were probably off base and getting something out of it. Well, this is actually something where, you know, the mechanics of um, social media work against us. Outrage really is something that contributes to virality, and it's too bad. You know, anger is one of the best emotions for getting people to reshare stuff. And, you know, I don't know how we get away from that. That's more of a, a problem than, than any, any sort of solution. Um, all right. JAS can't any means of communication serve public propaganda as much as it could serve enlightenment? Yeah, I, I don't think that there's a technology out there that can't be turned uh, for something bad. Um, and that's that's part of the nature of it. It's, it's interesting because tech people always want to say, oh, this is going to like change everything. You know, it's the, the eternal dream of like, well, we're going to finally have the right thing and nobody can possibly abuse it. That's part of why I'm a virtue ethicist. I think that we need the virtues in order to be able to have good communication and, and, and not abuse each other and, and you know steer ourselves towards the right way and have real solidarity. Um, John B., the Harper's letter is a joke. Who cares what any of these elite puppets think? So, I mean, I, I kind of sympathize with that. Um, I, don't, I don't have a lot of love for elites. I think many of you probably know. Um, and, you know, part of that is from seeing how, how things work in terms of, like, reproduction of the, the position of elites. Part of it is just, you know, studying social theory of different sorts. Um, I mean, I, I had one of my really formative experiences. And, and, you know, some people can look at this and say, oh, man, you, you were really lucky and privileged to do this. So I'm going to tell a, a, a real quick story. When I was in, in uh, uh, elementary school, you know, I was a really smart kid. I grew up out in the sticks in a rural area where we did have a gifted and talented program. And it was one lady who drove around the entire uh, district and would meet with us like once a month or so. And, and for a lot of my classes... Um, they would just, you know, like I was good at math. So they, in, in first grade, they gave me a fourth grade math textbook, put me over in the corner and said, go do problems. And then for like English, they'd send me to the library with one other kid and say, do some sort of project. You know, we, we don't want to see you. And so I wasn't getting that much out of school. I really did like gym and recess and art and music though. Um, <laughs> like the social aspects and creative aspects of things. Um, and so they wanted to advance me directly into seventh grade. And it was a rough, you know, school. And I was like, man, I'm going to get beaten up every single day. Um, not only am I a smart kid, so that, that's already got a target on my back, but I'm going to be smaller than everybody else. Uh, this is not a good idea. And my parents, I never actually told them that, but they, they wanted something more challenging for me. So they found a, a private school. And they found out that there were, <clears throat> there were scholarships that I could apply for. And I did, and I got the scholarships because I had high test scores. And the place that I went to, the students were almost invariably either smart, bring up the test scores, or rich. Very little overlap, right? And it was a cool place, you know, like we learned Latin, and, um, you know, the, the soccer coach was a former Olympian, and there were all sorts of really interesting aspects about that place. But, man, did I get to see how class dynamics work. You know, when you go to school and you're wearing the clothes that your mom made uh, or, you know, uh, the cheap jeans and, and corduroys that you bought uh, on sale and everybody else is wearing IZODs and, and, you know, polos and making fun of you for it, you get to see what happens when you do cross-country skiing because that's, that's what you can afford and everybody else has ski tags going down their, their thing. Um, so I think part of that, you know, part of my distrust of elites comes from experiences like seeing what, what it's like when you're in places and you're definitely not of the world, but what they used to call the demimonde, right? 
Um, and, and you're right. The Harper's people, none of them really have to worry about being canceled. Rowling is still selling books just fine. Uh, even if she never sells another book the rest of her life. So what? Is that really big repercussions? It's more about their feelings. It's more about them not getting to say what they want. As a matter of fact, I do one of the things I wanted to get to. Great example of this is um, uh, yeah, here we go. Um, So here's, here's something that Nolan said in The Coddling of the Elites. <clears throat> Thousands of low-paid journalists and freelancers and adjunct professors and grad student workers and other campus workers have fought and marched and organized and sacrificed to unionize. They have done so because many of them did not earn a living wage. Many of them suffered from racial discrimination or sexual harassment or other forms of institutionalized injustice. All of them lack the power to be able to negotiate fairly on their own behalf. Those are the people who actually make up the creative underclass. These are the people who work in the knowledge industries who are unable to exercise free speech because they often do not have the economic or social or cultural or labor power to do so. Um, I think that's completely right. You know, the, and this, you know, I, I mentioned that there's this thing about the, in the letter. So in the letter, it's speaking up for the rest of us, the restriction of debate, whether by a repressive government or an intolerant society invariably hurts those who lack power and makes everyone less capable of democratic participation. So that's true, but we didn't need them to tell us that because we already know that because we're already experiencing that. They're not. So who the hell are they to, to talk about it, right? And then he says, the way to defeat bad ideas is by exposure, argument, and persuasion, not by trying to silence or wish them away. There may be something to that, but yeah, we don't need these these elite people who signed the letter to, to do that. So... All right, um, let's go on. A lot of back and forth about the elite puppets idea. Um, Philosophy and critical thinking, am I aware of the DSA deplatforming Adolf Reed due to charges of being a class reductionist? If so, what are your thoughts on it? I'm not, because I don't follow the DSA very much. Um, and I think if, if they want to deplatform uh, somebody, they, they certainly can do that. Um, I'd have to look up who Adolf Reed actually is. But, uh, yeah. All right, mythological. Maybe you should read the first two pages of John Stuart Mill. Mob justice is the most vile and dangerous type of violence and silencing. It's kind of funny you'd think that I wouldn't be familiar with a book that I've been like reading for 30 years and teaching for 20, but thanks for the advice. All right, uh, let's see here. Oh, here's Mark Smith. <clears throat> Are you familiar with the concept of emotional labor? Do I think that intersects with issues of free speech and a duty to be informed? Yeah, I, um, not in a, in a simple way. There's a lot of people who enter into a discussion and then they say something boneheaded to somebody else who is like actually living out something. Um, and, and they're like, oh, it can't be as bad as you say. And then they're like, Jesus, why don't you like do your research? And then the first person is like, well, can you give me a list of sources? You know, can you do the work for me? <clears throat> you know, I, I, I encounter this in a more benign way when it comes to um, philosophical topics. Great example of that, that John Stuart Mill. You should read John Stuart Mill. Oh, come on, you know. Um, I, I, could, I could give you a whole list of secondary literature on it and some of my videos on it, but why, the, why should I do that work, you know? And if I shouldn't do that work, a fortiori, why should, for example, here's, here's something that, that's been coming up an awful lot. Why should African-American people who have been you know, suffering under you know, systematic racism in terms not just of policing, but education, housing, finance, you know, down the line, we can talk about this. Why the hell should they have to do the work of educating uh, other people who come into the d discussion and say, I don't really believe you? No, it's up to you. If you're, if you're the one being called out and somebody says, you don't actually understand what you're talking about. You got to do the work, you know. 
I think that's that's perfectly fair. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Let's see. Um, what else do we have? <laughs> here's, here's a remark that I'm not quite sure what, uh, oh, I think it's in, in relation to one of the things I said earlier. If that totally open discussion was anonymous, it would likely be a hellhole. Um, yeah, you know, the few times that I, I've gone on, on 4chan to look at things because people directed me to it, that's what 4chan kind of looks like. It's all anonymous people, all of them basically calling each other names and making a few good points here and there and sharing some, some interesting memes and stuff like that. Um, a, a lot of, you know, it's interesting. This, this is something that's been observed for now about 25 years, <clears throat> that the anonym, anonymity of being on the Internet and not showing your, your actual data enables people to say all sorts of bad things that they, they wouldn't normally say to another person. It first started getting noticed in chat rooms um, at, with the, the issue of what we called flaming, you know, and it's continued on into social media. Um, and there's even sort of a limited anonymity. I mean, a lot of people on Twitter have handles. Uh, they, don't, they, have, they don't show their face. They don't tell where they're from. Um, some people in Facebook, Facebook had to crack down on that. You remember? And people got really mad about that. So I think there's something to that, that idea that uh, anonymous discussions can sometimes be considerably worse because people feel... Uh, enabled to like let it all hang out. All right, let's see what else we we have. Uh, do, 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 do. Nicholas R. Should delusional individuals be kicked off popular platforms? I think of racist gathering on 4chan and end up in a bubble where they're never challenged and have their ideas reinforced. Well, I mean, 4chan, as far as I understand, is not going to actually do a lot of policing um, unless, you know, somebody's really, really, really egregious, right? And then they find other places to go to. Um, the times that I've been on it, it's pretty, you know, extreme stuff that people are saying. So it doesn't seem like they're doing much of policing. Should they be kicked off of, of other platforms, um, you know, as we start moving like into Reddit which is still pretty loosey goosey and then getting in you know, onto Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and stuff like that. We're talking about the issue of deplatforming. Um, I don't actually have that much of a problem with it myself, but then again, I'm not somebody who tends to say a lot of boneheaded stuff that I, I can't actually find some, some good justification, not, and I don't mean a good justification just to, from my own point of view, but like based in something for, for saying, and I try not to be offensive to people as well. Um, cause I think it's important not to, not to be offensive. Right. Um, but you can say, well, that's just, you know, self-serving, you know, what about the general principle? I mean, we can look at it in a couple different ways. One is that there's terms of service, and if you violate the terms of service, then YouTube, Twitter, they can kick you out. Um, I think that there have been some individuals who have been allowed to violate the terms of service an awful lot and get away with it because they're bigger accounts. Donald Trump is a great example, you know. Um, probably should have been kicked off a, a long time ago um, of Twitter, uh, but Twitter wanted to keep him on. Their justification was partly, well, you know, it's an important mode of communication for with the general public, which is bullshit because he's got a press secretary. You know, he can do whatever he wants. He doesn't actually have to be on Twitter to do it. He's got the whole U.S. government to, to do that with. Bradford says, isn't the original position the solution to all of this with Rawls? That's if you can get people to buy into Rawls, um, which is never going to happen. Um, cause nobody's ever, you're never going to get like complete agreement from, from everybody. I mean, I find that, that bringing up John Rawls and the veil of ignorance and the original position is good for getting people to think about, um, what it's like for other people in society and how they wouldn't like to be in, you know, in a disadvantaged position. I don't think it's particularly helpful for getting us to where we need to go in terms of anything more robust. So 
Um, let's see. So Bradford brings up a good point. In Europe, it is financially unviable to fire someone for speaking their opinion. Yes, they have a very different viewpoint. Not, uh, Europe minus Britain, of course. Um, they have a very different viewpoint on um, what employer labor relations ought to look like. And I, I hope someday we actually move closer to that because we are kind of the outliers among the developed world. I mean, you can also say something similar about Japan. Um, no, Australia is becoming more like the U.S. and, and, and Britain in that respect. Um, but, yeah, we, we have some really – we're a real weird outlier when it comes to a lot of things economically and in terms of healthcare care and, and other uh, things as well here in the United States. Um, all right. Uh, Life of Brian says, Omar Wasa made a comment on Twitter claiming that historically riots helped Republicans. He was pummeled on Twitter and fired from his analytics job. Tell me about how he is an asshole, Dr. Sadler. I don't know that he was. I didn't follow that one. Um, why don't you tell me how he was since you know more about it? And th there can certainly be exceptions, you know, uh, nobody's saying that this is going to be a perfect process and anybody demanding that is probably demanding the impossible and kind of stuck in an ideology. Um, what I'd want to know is I'd want to look at what else we know about Omar Wasau um, and uh, being pummeled on Twitter. You know, lots of people get pummeled on Twitter. I, I've been pummeled on Twitter before, um, probably not to that extent, but, you know, people go after whatever you have to say. So that's not it. Uh, fired from his analytics job, that's up to the analytics job. You know, if that that's the thing. If you don't like at-will employment, maybe work so that we don't have just at-will employment, right? Uh, then we don't have to worry quite so much about these. All right. Um, let's see what else we got here. I just skipped a little bit, and I got to wrap up because I got to have a conversation very soon about some editing work that I need to do, so I'm not going to get to everybody's stuff. Um, let's see, scrolling up. Um, so here's a really interesting one to end on from Moonchild. When it comes to critical thinking, and I think you could expand this to other, you know, constructs as well. Critical thinking, by the way, very equivocal term, you know, means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but that's a whole different conversation. We also talk about emotional intelligence, prudence or practical wisdom. When it comes to these sorts of things, the ego can make us interpret information in bad faith. Does it take psychological maturity to see others in good faith? Um, yes and no. It, it certainly does, people who are more mature, and not just psychologically, but also morally, you could say they've engaged in some moral development, um, are more likely to be able to engage with others in good faith. It doesn't mean that it's going to happen every time, it's not going to be perfect, uh, but we don't, we don't actually need that in order to, to talk about this. A lot of the people who argue in bad faith, it's usually because, in my experience, there's something flawed, something broken about them. And, you know, that's the normal human condition. It's not to say, oh, they're like defective, diseased, or something like that. No, they're, they're effed up like all of us are, but they're not working at it. They're not trying to make it better. Or if they are, they're doing so in the wrong way. Like people who get into stoicism and, you know, uh, wind up, you know, not actually reading Stoic texts, but actually just you're using soundbite stuff that they find on some listicle and then get into the dichotomy of control and think that Stoicism is just about withdrawing from the world, right? So, yeah, the people who are, are maturing are usually the people, you know, you could say that in the Venn diagram of those who are in good faith, there's a much bigger overlap with those who are mature than those who are not mature. And so we really ought to take personal development and maturation as something 
important for us, not just for, you know, having good speech with others, but for a variety of other things. You want to have good relationships with other human beings. You want to eventually understand, you know, a, a place in society that, that's good for you and you can do your best stuff there. You probably need maturity. I mean, this is part of why, again, a little bit off topic, when Emotional Intelligence came out, this book, you know, book by Daniel Goleman, one of the things that he was saying was, hey, as somebody who's been a psychologist observing you know, leaders, uh, here's one of my, my takeaways. It doesn't matter what your IQ is, your emotional quotient matters way more than your IQ for being able to like perform well at your job because you can test really well on, you know, cognitive things and, you know, uh, similes and manipulating shapes and stuff like that, but you can still be a complete jerk because you can't read other people and you don't know how to respond after you've screwed things up. Right. That's emotional intelligence. So yeah, developing as a human being, again, this, this notion of moving away in free speech from just insistence on rights and thinking about responsibilities, thinking about what good faith looks like, what, what kind of conversations you actually want to have, and being the kind of person who would, would generally have good conversations with people. I think that's really quite important. And so that's a nice place to end this on. Uh, obviously, I don't get to everybody's questions and never do. But it's been a good conversation. Glad all of you could join me for it. And uh, next month, I, I'm thinking the big topic is going to be, should we be sending all the kids back to school or not, which is a, an interesting political question here in the United States. I'm going to do a little bit of reading as well about what's happening in all the other countries because I, I want to do some comparative analysis as well. But I think that'll be, you know, so it'll be August. That'll be a quite germane topic. So I'll see all of you.